Welcome to the Startup Grind. Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to Startup Grind, Barley Chapter. It's lovely to see so many of you. So, Startup Grind. Startup Grind is for grassroots entrepreneurs. It's designed to educate, to inspire, and most importantly, for you guys to connect. And it was fantastic to see so many of you having great conversations outside. My name's Caroline Thomas. I'm a UK entrepreneur. I run a social media marketing agency, and I've got a team of four in the UK. Why am I in Bali? Right now, I'm facilitating iLab 14. iLab is a 30-day entrepreneur program that runs from Vision Villa Resorts here. And it's, it's a program that's designed to help businesses establish, to grow, to be able to be location independent. Today, we've got an amazing speaker. I'm super excited. Not only is he a TEDx speaker, not only is he the chairman that enables giving globally, not only does his brilliant information transform businesses, but he's been here at iLab all day long sharing his wisdom with our guys. He is the one and only Paul Dunn, but we've got to give him a really warm welcome because if we don't make enough noise, he's not going to come out here, okay? So let's have a go. Please welcome everybody to Paul Dunn. <laughs> Okay, he's not moving. We've got to make it bigger and louder and stronger. So are we ready? One, two, three, welcome Paul Dan! Hey, that was a lovely welcome, thank you. Whoa, that was cool. How did you do that? Lots of energy. Oh, good. <laughs> Lots of energy. So Paul, it's great to have you with us here today. It's, it's great to be here. And Startup Grind is all about grassroots entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And it's about... Um, learning how to grow your business. It's about connecting to each other. So the first thing I want you to do, and I know we've talked a lot about connection today, is to connect with the audience. So who is Paul Dunn? Oh, my goodness. Um, well, <laughs> uh, looking around the audience, I've probably had more years of being Paul Dunn than most people <laughs> have had being them. So you understand this could be the entire evening whilst I talk about who is Paul Dunn. Um, if I were to simplify it, uh, it's, I think, I, I'm one of those, those guys that, or people that's just had an extraordinary lucky life. Uh, you know, to be one of the first 10 uh, in Australia in Hewlett Packard, for example, if you can imagine that, and, and actually having breakfast with, you know, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard and all of that. I mean, how could you not be in that environment and just get amazing things? And then, you know, to, to form uh, one of Australia's first computer companies, which was, I think, an amazing thing to be able to do. And, and we got lucky again mm -hmm. in the sense of timing. And then I went to a program like this. Someone actually, uh, you know, I had like 150 people in the company and, and someone called me up one day and they said, I want you to come to a seminar. And this person was, um, do we have any Australians in the audience? By, by the way, okay. <laughs> the, the, the Australians can be aggressive, you know what I mean? I, thanks and, uh, and, and this boy, I still remember it. Her name was Tammy and, and Tammy said, I want you to come to this seminar. And I said, Tammy, why on earth would I want to come to a seminar? We're doing, you know, $30 million. Uh, I've got these 150 people, why on earth? And she literally, she was a she, and she actually said, now the Australians will appreciate this. She said, I will rip your bloody arms off unless you come. <laughs> I'm not making it up, she did. So I went to this seminar, and uh, some of you would know the person who was there. Was, is, he, he died about three years ago now, but it was Jim Rohn. I, I'm sure some of you know Jim Rohn. And, uh, you know, for me, it was life-changing. It really was. I mean, here was this guy who didn't move very much, but what he said just made sense, made, made absolute sense. And, and that was when I decided that my love, my passion, if you will, it kind of came home to me, was I, I, I was looking at him as like being in a time tunnel. And, and I thought, that's me. I can do that. I, I want to do that. And so I, I resigned or left the, the computer company and, and then created uh, my, my own company, training people. And that was, that was just an extraordinary thing to be able to do. And then that grew, uh, you know, so we had, I think, about 23,000 clients around the world. And, uh, and again, just, just luck and, 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 you know, being in the right place at the right time 
and I think always coming from a place of trying to, my, my thing was to add value, always to add value, and it was always to have fun. And, and that was it for me, right? And then we all have, I think every one of us has moments, right, in, in our life. And then I had uh, a, another moment which for me changed everything. And, and, and that was, uh, some of us would remember the 2004 tsunami, right? Uh, you know, and um, I, uh, 18 months after that, um, I, I, I came across someone who'd been really impacted by that. And um, long story short, uh, this guy had, had, uh, had 12, 12 kids at, at a Sunday school. And he went out and, and, uh, and he saw this, he heard this noise and he heard this, saw this great wall of water coming. And he was telling me the story and I said, what, what did you do? And he said, well, I went in and I said to the kids, you know, stay calm, it's okay, but let's all hold hands and, and, and run to the top of the hill. So he told me how he did that. His name was Pastor Selba. And he said, so imagine being on the top of this hill with, with six children on either side. <laughs> it's, it's a bit jokey. It doesn't, anyway, so imagine being there and, and you look and then the church that you've built just gets, you know, smashed like matchbox. And then you see the parents of the children getting washed away as well. And I said, well, uh, I, I can't remember exactly what I said, but probably at some point I said, what did you do then? And, and he told me this amazing story about how he was then traveling around India for 18 months trying to find a home for these kids. And he had just three weeks before that, before I met him, he had found this place and, and everything else. But he said, you know, it's now really desperate. The kids need to go to school. And, and they need uniforms, and I think many of us would know that the schools in, in India are free, but you've got to have a uniform, which means they're not really free. Um, and, uh, you know, they need insurance, they need books, they need food. And I said, I remember saying to him, I said, well, so how much would, would does that cost? And he said, that's three and a half thousand dollars. And I said, oh, that's per child, right? And, and he said, no, 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 that's, that's for all 12. So just imagine if we were in that room, where I was that day, we, you would have done exactly what I did, which was, hey, it's fixed. You don't know how it's gonna, you can fix it, but you fixed it. And so I fixed there, and, I, and then a couple of weeks later, I got this, this, uh, this wonderful email from him. He'd gone down to a, an internet cafe. And then just quickly, to, to get to the, the point of the story, he'd also borrowed a camera. And he had these four photographs, and, and the first photograph was this long shot of the house where these kids were, and it, it looked kind of interesting. And then the next shot was inside the house. And all these kids are in a circle. And he's got this little note. And he's saying, see, they've got food now. And here they are all around this thing having food. And then the next shot was the same room and the same circle. But this time, the bowls of food have been replaced by, with, uh, with books. And he said, see, they're studying. And they're doing all of that. And then the next shot was the close-up. And it was the close-up of the, of the home. And right across the top of this home, they had, they had written, Paul Dunn Home. And I go, oh, my God. <laughs> and that was when, you know, I really got that, that you know, first of all, there's so much out there that we can, we can connect into. And uh, then, you know, just after that, I think many of us could relate to the fact that once you lock onto something, something comes into your world, all of a sudden, other things come into your world which are the same. So, for example, if we, if we could imagine... Uh, getting a new car and we and we drive down the road with a new car It's really interesting how that happens that all of a sudden every other car coming the other way is the same as the new car that you've got You know that you've noticed that and so somehow or other I, I, I was in a space where again lucky uh, People uh, or a, a particular person came to me with an idea uh, I was mentoring them and it was about this whole idea that wouldn't it be great if you could if you could create she said I I, I, I really want to create a, a world that's a happier world because that's a world that would be full of giving and how can I do that and that was when the whole you know buy one give one thing uh, came up in in 2007 and uh, so since then that's that's been uh, my my world but it's also about working with uh, entrepreneurs and and growing their businesses and then showing them how they can have that same kind of experience so yeah it's been a, an amazing journey yeah. <laughs> So, so I'm going to take you back a little bit because some of our audience are still working. They're still 
employed um, and, and start up a business yeah. can seem quite scary when you move from a corporate world or from an employed world to all of a sudden running your own business. So what, what would be your recommendations? What would be your advice? You've done that. You've been there. Mm. How did that feel for you? And, and what would you do? Would you do anything differently? Well, yeah, I think I'd, I, I think I'd do it quicker. Okay. Uh, now. <laughs> no, because because in in those days, uh, which of course was eighteen hundred and seventy three, when when we did that, <laughs> but but in 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 those days, um, you know, it was it was a little tougher. You you couldn't create businesses in your bedroom, which you you know, which you now can do with technology, and so you needed you know you needed capital, you needed all those sorts of things. So. I think now I would start it. Uh, I, I, I would start it quicker. Uh, but the other thing I think about that, and it's a great question. I, I think that now what we're seeing is that more and more people are, are recognizing that, and this is not anti-corporate. It's really not. But more and more people are realizing that in the corporate arena, they're they're really not getting meaning and purpose anymore. It's it, it's like it's um, you know it's like. And again, I don't want to say that people are focusing on profit other than that's what they actually do <laughs> instead of focusing on purpose. And uh, so little wonder that when you do that, uh, the, the people around you aren't getting the same meaning and purpose. So I think I'm seeing many more people now wanting to, to take that leap. And as it happened, I, 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 I mentioned this book to you today, and it, for anybody uh, who's uh, in that space of, of wondering what to do. This uh, this is a great book. Some of you would know Seth Godin, um, and this is Seth's latest book, and, and it's, it's an amazing, amazing book. Um, and the title of the book, I think, says it all. And it says, what to do when it's your turn, okay? And then the, the little subtext down the bottom says, and it's always your turn, right? So what that says is the opportunity now is for us to really step up and and, and look at some of the issues out there, look at some of the opportunities, and really just go for it. And it's and so much easier to do. And we were talking about opportunities earlier, yeah. and we were talking about it's become the collaboration economy. Yeah. So people who are starting in their bedrooms, as you say, I mean, some people start there and some people start with a whole lot of investment. Yeah. But it's always about collaboration. So, so when people are thinking about that, what is it that you think that connects people? Well, do they connect on passions? Do they connect on skills? Where have you seen the best connections happen and, and the most success come from? Yeah, and, and again, that's a great question. I, I, I was uh, in a, a meeting uh, in Sydney not that long ago, and it was one of those sort of startup accelerator uh, meetings, and and there were uh, venture capitalists were there saying, you know, this is what you need to do and all that. And and one guy got up, and, and I won't mention his name for obvious reasons, and, and he said, look, he said, you'll, you'll get a lot of people saying to you, in fact, everybody else that day said, what you got to do is follow your passion. And he said, that, that my experience is, that's wrong. He said, what you have to do is you've got to follow the money. And the moment he said that, you, you could see everybody kind of recoiled because somehow or other that just didn't resonate with them. And, and so I think it is following the passion. Another way of saying it, and I'm indebted to uh, Mr. Godin for this, uh, this not because it's in that book, but something else he once said. And, and he said, he said it, it, the, the challenge and the opportunity is, it's not to figure out how to be successful. The challenge and the opportunity is to figure out how to matter. And does that, does that make sense? And so once you can do that by following the, you know, your, your, your passion and, and, and by having some other, or if you will, bigger purpose, that then connects other people into that purpose. Then the reality is, you will you will create you will create more collaboration because all of a sudden people can share, you know, they can see what's going on in the world. They can see that you're standing up and saying this is something I'm determined to fix. So that 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 would be it for me. And if if people are looking to find where they connect on purpose, mm. what kind of place? Where can they find that? Oh, connectonpurpose.com. <laughs> <laughs> Does that exist? <laughs> well, well, I, 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 again, um, you know, it, it's, it's the same story as, you know, as what I said, that when you get in a particular space, more stuff comes your way, right? 
So uh, the you know every day I, I'm getting emails from from people who and in fact it's happened today. Uh, people are saying you know I have this particular thing that's really important to me. Um, how, you know what do I need to do next? And 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 because you know I'm I'm fortunate to be in that space, you can go oh well you need to connect with this person right here and that person right here. But but it doesn't happen until you stand up and 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 declare what matters for you. And this is. This is what I'm going to do, and it doesn't matter what it takes. That's what I'm going to do, and that that becomes, you know, I think a very compelling thing. It's one of the things we talked about today. You know, it's a, it's about this about this why you get up in the morning. The moment you know why you get up every morning, and as we jokingly said today for the Australian guys here, um, you don't get up every morning to have a pee. All right, that's not what you get up to do. Uh, so. The moment you're very clear about that, and you know, I look around the room. I look at I look at Tyler here, who's very clear about why he does stuff, and and, and other people around Janie sitting right next to him, um, they're very very clear. And it's that clarity that creates certainty for other people, and it becomes very compelling. So I, I'm I'm a I'm a you know I'm a hundred percent for the passion. Yeah. Okay, so some of some of the audience were fortunate enough to to run an exercise earlier today, mm. and um, just to get to their why. So I wondered if you could share that for the people that weren't in the room already. Oh yeah, what do you do? Yes, what you do? Those of you who I, I, I actually I got this here. Um, oh, I thought oops, a second. God, I'm going to die. This is a pacemaker. <laughs> <laughs> we have people who can do something about that. Somewhere or other I put my iPhone, and I don't know where on earth I put it, so we're going to imagine that's an iPhone, okay? Um, so, oh, someone's volunteering an iPhone, how, how nice. Uh, a six plus would be very good at this point. So, so, yeah, one of the things that you don't do, oh, look at that, I see a, I see a uh, is that a six plus? Goodness me, that's way too big for me. Look at that, it's, uh, no, this, I, 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 I was saying that I, I have a problem with the six plus because it looks like an Android, doesn't it? Which is, you know, not, not Anyway, so what you do, <laughs> which is like this program is not brought to you by Google, it's yeah. brought to you by Apple. Right? So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, what you do, I mean, traditional wisdom says, here's what traditional wisdom says. Traditional wisdom says what you've got to do is you've got to have a business plan. By the way, don't come to me, don't come to me with a business plan. Don't come to me and say, here's the business plan, I want you to invest in that. Uh, that is just, that's just insane, I think. To, first of all, if you show me a spreadsheet, I'm going to turn off. I mean, that's, that's not what I do. But to, to believe that someone is going to sit there and watch and read those 70 pages or whatever it is that you've done is, is an insane thought. That's not what they do. So they are going to get it. Where are they going to get it? They're going to get it in the first paragraph. They're going to get it in the first paragraph. Right? That's, and, and once they get it, then they may choose to read the rest. But if that first paragraph is you know, not there, that, that thing, then it, they're not going to read it. So the way you get to the first paragraph, the way you get to what your why is, is you use this device. You could all do this on the way home tonight. It's really fun. And you turn it on and you press the record button, wherever that is, and, and you just turn to it and you say, you complete the following sentence. I get up every morning too. That's it. You say, I get up every morning. By the way, you've got to say more than that for those of you that weren't here. So it's like... I get up every morning to blah, 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 whatever it is. Don't you dare write it down because the writing down is not you. The speaking is you. And then, as we said today, Caroline, you just listen to that back and you go, hmm, was that resonant? Was I using too many words? Was it, you know, crazy? And then you just do it again and you just get it to the point where you can say to people, well, this is what I do. I get up every morning. And if you want to know what I get up every morning to, I, I get up every morning to give businesses the power to change lives of people that they don't even know. That, that's, that's what I do. I think that's kind of compelling. Um, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't have that why. But, but it's as simple as that. And, and it's not a mission statement. It's not a, a vision statement. It is just I get up every morning too. And Simon Sinek, some of you would know Simon Sinek who, who wrote Start With Why. And Simon once said to me, he said, you know what, you, he says, here's what you've got to do. He says, y you imagine that you've landed on a, you're on a, you're on a train. And you're on this train and, and you, you, you get to this very big station. And he said, I want you to imagine that you've got a big red hat on. All you've got is a big red hat or maybe pink hair. But, but no, red, red, red hat would be, I think, probably 
more stand out. She didn't hear that, but anyway, she did. <laughs> anyway, you get this big red hat, and he said, it won't happen instantly, but pretty soon there will be other people coming into the station who are also wearing a red hat, and they'll stand next to you. And the moment you get two people standing next to you, guess what? Pretty soon you'll get four. Pretty soon you'll, did you, did you see the idea? So it's just standing there and declaring, this is what I stand for, and then getting back to what you said, then that collaboration will get together. But it's because you're standing for something, and, and you're very clear about your why. And being true to your whys can sometimes help you through the challenges in business. Always. So, especially when times get hard. Yeah. So, bearing in mind that the entrepreneurial journey can be very bumpy at times. Yeah. There's great times, but there's also some challenges. Yeah. I wondered if you'd be happy to share with us one of the challenges that you've faced in business and how you overcame it. It's a really interesting question. I, I, I remember... <laughs> I remember a time when I, I was in um, is in Melbourne, and, and someone asked me. Uh, someone was doing a program, and I was kind of there supporting them. And uh, this person said, uh, "Oh, we're going to talk about failure." And and he said, "And I know that Paul's successful, so therefore he must have a lot of failures. So have had a lot of failures. So so let's welcome Paul Dunn, right, to talk about failure." And I froze in my seat, and I, I just froze. And this guy said, he said, oh, Paul's just playing, kind of like tonight, you know, Paul's just playing hard to get, come on, we need to get everything else. So it was really, and I'm still frozen in my seat. And then finally, this guy came and dragged me out the front. And he said, and, and I remember there, there, was, there was this wall back here, and he said, okay, Paul, uh, so what, what, what's failure mean to you? And as he was saying it, I, I found myself just walking. It was the most bizarre experience. I, I just found myself walking back here. I found myself walking backwards, sorry, Jay, walking backwards until I had no place else to go. I was locked against the wall. And, and the guy said, what's going on? And I said, uh, Mike, I, 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 I just don't know, but what I do know is I can't answer the question because, and, and the way I rationalized it after that, it, it was a really surreal experience. The way I rationalized it was, I, the word failure wasn't there. It just, it just wasn't there. Do you know what I'm saying? So I couldn't say it means this or it means that. So I guess what, what you surmise from that most likely is there is no such thing as that. It's, it's just, uh, you know, it's just you found out that that option didn't work. But what a great learning experience that was so that you can, you can find things. You know, I mean, if we hold up the iPhone, you know, jobs, you know, the interesting thing is that we would not have that if we had not had an iPhone 1. So the, the opportunity to go out there and, and fail is just an incredible, uh, I think, an incredible opportunity to, but, but uh, how, how can I put it? The moment you get that all that's going to do is tell you what doesn't work, therefore it saves you time, then you go on another journey. So I'm not sure whether that was the answer you like, but it's funny you, when you brought it up, I just saw it very clearly, what happened years ago. I think it's just good to connect because sometimes you can be in a place where you think challenge means I've got to stop, but actually from challenge creates opportunities and clarity that, yeah. that move you to where you need to be quicker. But, it, but it's not always easy to do, you know. I mean, if all of a sudden, you know, for example, money isn't coming in or whatever it is and, you, you know, you're on your last whatever it is, it's not always easy to say, oh, this is a great learning experience. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the reality is it is. I, 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 so I, I get that it's not easy to do that, but that's exactly what it is. And, and some of the challenges that, that we face today is that business is moving so much quicker. Yeah. You know, you said you couldn't just start up in your bedroom now, but you can. Mm -hmm. And with technology, and you know, we discussed some of this earlier. Yeah. So... You know, it's six years now from 2020. Where do, where do you see business being? How are we going to be working in 2020? Where do you think we're going as, a, as you know, we're in the collaboration economy already. We've got technology. The, well, the opportunities I saw, I, feel I saw, endless. Yeah, I saw a quote the other day that said, predicting the future, uh, pr prediction, making predictions is difficult, particularly if it involves the future. And so, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, okay, someone, someone's got that, right? So that was, that was good. Uh, and and I, I mean, I, I, I seriously don't know. I, I mean, how do you know? I mean, I think, I, I think the, the big challenge now is, is how do you 
how do you do stuff or how do you quote unquote plan for stuff in a world that is so unpredictable? How do you, how do, you do that? I mean, does anyone know what's going to happen next year? I have no idea. So, so but I, I do get that in 2020, we're going to be doing things differently. And, and um, you know, I, 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 I think I said earlier that if I were looking for where the opportunities were, um, what, what I would do is I would, I would kind of be like a Sir Richard Branson approach to it. And, the, the, uh, and you know, I, I did an article in Forbes recently with, with Sir Richard, which was interesting because it was all about disruption. And, and so what he talks about is that I just look at industries. I pretend I'm a customer of that industry. And then I see whether I think it's ready for disruption. And if it's ready for disruption, then I will move into, you know, so you take the railways, you take, you know, in the, in the United Kingdom, all of that kind of stuff. So I think that's what I would do. I would look around and I would say, what, what stuff, um, for example, right, right now, you might choose to look at, at banking because banking is clearly, clearly, whatever you look at it, uh, we, we're going to be, you know, you've got things like Apple Pay and all of that kind of stuff. We've got things like Square. We've got all of those sorts of interesting things. I mean, it, it, what's interesting is in Kenya right now, in Kenya, if you, if you look at uh, pe people in Kenya who are quote unquote uh, in poverty and everything else, what, what's, what's happened is they, because of the way technology works, they have jump started the kind of stuff that we used to have. So we used to have, for example, fixed land, you know, landline phones. Well, they didn't have that, right? So they jumped straight into the mobile thing. They don't know anything else. And so one of the most important mobile banking facilities right now was a, it's actually called M-Pesa, and, and it was developed by two young guys in Kenya. And so all of a sudden, uh, all of these people who, who didn't even have bank accounts, all of a sudden they've got mobile phones, and as a result of that, they've got access to the banking economy. That could not be done before. And we're going to see more and more and more and more of that. Um, the reason we're also going to see more of that is we've learned through 2008, uh, you know, with the global financial crisis, we, we or so whatever it was, <laughs> We, we've learned that we cannot trust the institutions that we thought we could trust, right? We, 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 we learned, when with respect to if anyone's in a, in a bank here, I'm sorry to say it, but, but the reality is that we don't trust that anymore. There's just been so much crap that's gone on that how could you possibly trust that system? So that has got to be something that's available that, that is going to be disrupted, and it's going to be disrupted by you know, young people who, 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 who feel this thing. So that's what I would do. I would look around and I would see where, where is the opportunity to do seamless transactions? Where is the opportunity? Yeah, well, let's take taxes. I mean, in, in, in what, the last 18 months, we've seen Uber and all that kind of stuff. And by the way, that's really interesting. I, I mean, I, I have issues with Uber. Um, I really do. I, I, I think they started out with a, with a, great, a, a great vision to kind of um, you know, free up that whole taxi thing. But I really, I really have issues when when they raise $40 billion, or they, at least their they market cap now, or they, they reckon that's what they value that. And so someone asked the question the other day, so what, what, does, what does Uber do with $40 billion? What does it do with a billion dollars? Because it doesn't have any stock, it doesn't have any, you know, it doesn't have any. So what does it do? What it actually does is if you went to start a taxi company here in Bali, and let's say Uber had a thing in there, then what would happen is Uber would overnight run their price to zero. That's, that's what they do. And, they know, and so that money is just being used to, do, do, do you see that? So you cannot possibly survive. So then you go dead, bang, up comes the thing again. I'm not really sure whether, whether that's the kind of model that I'd want to be a part of. But fortunately, there are other people, there are some, some young kids in, in uh, Malaysia who started a thing which is, uh, I'm not sure it's in Bali, but it's certainly in Singapore. And it's a fabulous app. It's called Grab Taxi. It's really, really fabulous. And it works, I think, a little better than Uber, actually. Um, and just recently, and, and they're just software guys, you know, who coded and did all this lovely stuff. And just recently, I think it was 10 days ago, they got an investment of $75 million. What's interesting is, who did they get that from? Answer, VCs in China gave them that. So, you know, there's a... All of this stuff, I think, that's um, I, that probably wasn't the answer to your question, but but it is to say that we, you know, the taxi thing is an example. 
It may be healthcare is an option as well where you want to look. All of those sorts of things. So it's just a matter of what, another way of thinking about it is when I'm a customer of something, is that a frustrating experience? If that is a frustrating experience, it probably means that there's a better way of doing it and you could be the one that steps up and does it. Did that make sense? Yeah, I'm, yeah, it did. I it <laughs> so looking at the fact that we're in Bali mm. and we're in Indonesia, some research I've done recently, and one of the things I'm super excited about just being here, is the fact that Indonesia is going to be responsible for 25% of global growth by 2020. It's amazing stat. So, you know, I'm from the UK. I come out here and I explore, and I know that you're originally from the UK. So what took don't, you... Oh, did, don't, don't say that. Shh. What, what originally took you overseas, and, and now you kind of live, you know, you travel all over the world and you live your passion traveling all over the world. So for those people who are looking to make their business more location independent, you know, are, are there any particular areas that you think that people should focus in or? Well, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, this, this whole thing that we mentioned before about, uh, okay, well, let, let, me, let, me, let me blend together two thoughts. So if you take, for example, accountants. Let's just take accountants. And if it would be interesting to sort of say to anybody in the audience who's not an accountant or anybody joining us online and, and, and say, by the way, put up your hands if you love the experience of dealing with accountants. Well, you know, I, you don't, right? You just don't. Um, and so what we've now seen is we see people, and I'll, I'll come to the, the, real, the real hub of the question, but so what we now see is, is people who before would have needed to have massive infrastructure and all that kind of stuff, now they sit there with their Mac or whatever it is they're sitting there with and, and they can outperform, outservice, outturn on a, on a dime, you know, the big, four, the big four accountants or whatever. And so, but what's interesting is those people, because again they started without baggage, right? They just started in their bedroom and, and all of a sudden, they're online, and so they're now servicing people. Traditionally, you know, you would service people within this area. So they're now servicing people around the world. They can do that on Skype or on Zoom or wherever they want. They're connected through Zero and everything else. So what we're actually seeing now is, is something that, that our friend Dan Priestley talks about. And he says, you know, that w there's this new term now, and the term is it's no longer small business. The term is global small business. And so when we're starting... Uh, whatever it is we're starting, we need to start from the position, I think, that it is going to be global. And the moment we start from that position, then the next question we have to, have to ask is, okay, if that's the case, who am I then going to connect with and how do I make myself more attractive to those people in those countries that might want to connect and so we can build something exciting? So, yeah, that, that's, that's, I think, uh, the, the, the way I would do it. But, you know, the whole Indonesia thing is, is just fascinating. But then... You look on top of that, and you've got you know 1.2 billion people in India, and, and people in India are just doing amazing, amazing, amazing things in the social entrepreneur uh, space. China hasn't yet figured that one out, but again, there's you know 1.2 billion there. So, but if you think about Indonesia and say 25% of the growth is going to come from there, it's like wow, really exciting, right? Super exciting. Yeah, but I but I really think some uh, a, a mentor of mine one time, he he talked about. You know, people saying, oh, yeah, well, the economy is tough and all of that. And this, this friend of mine, he, his, name is, his name is Ron Tacky. And Ron said years and years ago, <laughs> when, I, when I first started speaking, uh, he, he said, Paul, you always need to remember that the economy is between your ears. And, and, and I, 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 I like that thought. You know, it's what we create. It's, it's not, we're not the victim of this. We can create whatever it is we want to create. And, and all the while we have that thought, then I think, you know, it just looks very rosy after. So with your international speaking experience and, and the fact that we're going to be creating... By the way, has Oprah contacted you? No, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I am available. <laughs> so so with, the, with the international speaking and the fact that when people start up and as they're growing their business, they need to be thinking globally... How different is it to do business globally to doing business locally? You know, there's culture, there's, there's words that maybe mean something different in mm. different languages or cultures. So, mm. so what advice would you have to someone who is looking for global, but a, a global audience that's really never done that before? 
Well, I mean, again, it comes back to the collaboration. So you've got to have some sense of what the culture is, and and every, so therefore you connect with people who are in that country to do, for example, you know, the face-to-face -face things or whatever else. But you know, I I was talking with with someone the other day who was from where were they from? They were from Germany, and uh, they were wanting to use the uh, the B one G one site, right? As in the buy one give one site, and they said, does it exist in German? And I said, well, actually, yeah. Look, if you if you scroll down, you see that little thing there, it's called Google Translate. You just pick, push that button, and all of a sudden, it's in German. And they go, oh, yeah. You know, so, <laughs> so I mean, it's, it's not too challenging you know, to do that because, because those things are there. And what was it, just this week? In fact, it was just this week. Skype, uh, which is now owned by Microsoft. So, 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 uh, so but uh, by the way, the guys who founded Skype, I don't know if you've seen it, but you know, they sold that to Microsoft, and uh, they've been kind of quiet for a little while in, in Sweden, uh, but they're doing something very exciting. You want, you want, to, have a, you want to download this, it's called Wire, and, and it's really, really exciting in terms of, of, of that thing. But anyway, um, so, so Skype, did you read it? Where, where Skype have now got, you know, when you're making a, a Skype call, it's all free and everything else, you, you literally can, can push a button and you get speech to speech translation. So here you are speaking to a Japanese person and you're saying, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, Fred-san or something, <laughs> how's the weather in Tokyo? And that gets translated the moment you say it. And, and he's hearing that in, in Japanese. And then he says, Oi -ho, da -ho, da -ho, and you go, oh, I see. And, 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 <laughs> and that's that's right now. I mean that that is that is here right now today. So so that's just and and it's instant. It's like oh my god, you know. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, great times, isn't it, to be able to to explore that. I think the other interesting thing about that too is I was saying to someone today, we we still have this interesting thing. Which is, you remember years ago, you know, that thing about you're never a prophet in your own land. And, and I think that's very true. I still think that's true. So when you might be from wherever it is you are, Bali or whatever, but then you say you turn up in Los Angeles, let, let's just say, that is instantly more attractive to someone in Los Angeles to have someone from Los Angeles turn up. Do, do, do you see what I mean? So, so I, I think that's, a, that's an interesting uh, kind of way of thinking about it as well. And by the way, in terms of in terms of raising funds, <clears throat> yes, we've got Indiegogo, we've got Kickstarter, we've got all of those things. But what's really interesting is when you when you go and a, a friend of mine just did that. Well, not just about a year ago did this. Go goes to Silicon Valley, and this guy happens to be a New Zealander, and so you know not too many of them go to like no, I'm not kidding. So anyway, but but he's starting a, a, a software. Well, he. He started a software company some time ago. There's a guy called Rod Drury. Some of you would know Rod. Uh, Rod started Zero, right? And uh, so, and Rod, by the way, Rod is really interesting. Um, I, I met with Rod uh, one day uh, over coffee in Wellington. And so, you know, you all know Zero. You know, beautiful accounting software, and some of us are using that thing, right? And that's a great example of a company in New Zealand who's taking on the world, you know, from New Zealand. So. Anyway, so we're having coffee in Wellington, and Rod says to me, he says, uh, oh, Paul, can I tell you why, he, he, seriously, he said, can I tell you why I get up every morning? And I'm going, my God, you, you know the script, right? So, so I said, sure. Now, here's this guy running a software company, and he says, I'm, I'm, not, I'm seriously not making this up. He says, I get up every morning to create better hospitals and roads. And I said, I said, pardon? You, you know, you've been out last night or something? Or, and he said, no. He said, I'm very clear. I get up every morning to create better roads and hospitals. And I said, Rod, I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm hearing that right. Because you create a software. You've got this beautiful accounting software. What on earth does that have to do with creating better roads and hospitals? Good question, right? And, and he said... Well, Paul, what we're doing is we're enabling small to medium-scale enterprises to be so much smarter 
in the way in which they do things, to make that thing so much smoother, uh, get this. And so he said, they're going to be more successful as a result of using this. So, and he's, he's very straight on it. He said, so when they're more successful, that actually means that they will pay more taxes. And as a result of them paying more taxes, then we will have better roads and hospitals. And I go, wow. And, and the funny thing is about that, that he's the guy who went to New Zealand, uh, went to, um, uh, to um, LA, uh, Silicon Valley, and he meets with Peter Thiel. Who's Peter Thiel? Peter Thiel's the guy who founded uh, PayPal. And, and you know, he'd just written a book on that whole thing. It came out a couple of weeks ago. And so he's sitting with Peter Thiel. And Peter Thiel says, what's so special about this company? And Rod says, I get up every morning to create better roads and hospitals. And Thiel's never heard anybody say that. <laughs> and, and, so, and, and seriously, uh, Rod's friend was there, Hamish, and, and, and he said, Paul, it was amazing. We just said that to Thiel and we gave him a couple of other things. And Thiel opened his checkbook and said, would $75 million do? So you're kidding me, right? So I think that sort of goes full circle to, you know, really articulating why you're doing stuff and it's not about the money, it's about other stuff and it's about the consequences and so on and so forth. And when you do that, people will just maybe open their hearts, which is interesting, but maybe other people will open their wallets uh, as well because you've you you figured out not how to be successful but how to matter right and, and when that all comes it to me it just comes together in a beautiful way we talk about making a difference and we're talking about how to to matter one of the things that i know is really close to your heart is b1g1 mm. so can you just give people who maybe don't know so much about b1g1 an overview and why why it impacts businesses so significantly sure 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 um the, the quickest way I, I can do that is, is to say, let's, let's just imagine a, a very different world just for a moment. Let, let's just imagine a very different world where we all understand that what I do to you, I do to me. Where we all, we absolutely understand that. Um, and so how, how then would you create a, a more interesting world? So, so imagine if every time someone bought, you know, a, a TV or something like that. And, and, and just imagine that when that happened, someone who could not see got the gift of sight just because, you, just because that happens. Or imagine someone got a cup of coffee and, and a kid, and there are 700 million kids uh, who, who don't have access to water. So imagine that we set it up so that every time someone had a cup of coffee, you know, a kid got access to water. Just, just imagine that world. I imagine a world where, where someone buys a book and, and as, as a result of the book getting bought, um, someone, well, not maybe someone, but an orangutan who's getting the hell knocked out of their environment through palm oil, all of a sudden that doesn't happen anymore because someone is planting trees and regenerating the forest. So, so what happens is you get this kind of one-for-one one kind of thing going on and where you do that and something great happens and you do that and something else great happens and so on and so forth. And, and I mean, I know it sounds like an idyllic world and, and what do you reckon? Is that an idyllic world? It's kind of, it is. But the reality is it's not woo-woo, right? It's not woo-woo because as we're sitting here now, I just checked actually and, and that simple idea has generated, as, as we're speaking tonight, already uh, 55,844,000 uh, giving impacts. Uh, the way... <laughs> um, it's cool. Thank, thank you very much uh, for that. And, and, and of course, it's not us that are doing that. It's, that's the other thing about, you know, I mean, people, when you say that, people are going to go, oh, well, you know, B1, G1 must be a great thing. And it's, it's not actually B1, G1 that's great. It's just, you know, we, we, we were able to develop this platform where other people could then use it and, and be great. It's, it's, it's kind of like, so anyway, that's, that's what it is. But I think also uh, that's something else about where, where this whole conversation uh, would lead in, in as much as, 
I think uh, if we if we are to talk about the reality is that stories are really important. Stories are so 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 important, and so maybe as a, as a result of because that's how we learn and you know. So so here's an interesting question. So if we if we think back to this, you know, that it's your turn, and it's always your turn, um, then what's what's the story that you're creating? And one of the things that I think is interesting is to think of it this way, that up until maybe this point in time, we've always been told that, you know, you, you do development, you do business, you do all of that on account of how that's, that's something that makes you feel great, right? That's what you do. And so that's what your story is. So your story becomes... How can I do stuff that is all about me aspiring to be great? Right? That's how it becomes. But what if you flip it and you say, actually, the story might be not about you aspiring to be great, but about you inspiring others to be great. And, and, and when you do that, you get this, this interesting kind of pull uh, back the other way. And, and I, I, you know, for me... I mean, again, it sounds real woo-woo almost, you know, but the reality is that's that's what's happening. We're seeing more and more now. We're seeing, you know, the development of movements like conscious capitalism and all of that sort of stuff. B Corporation in the U.S., which is which in the U.S., which is very very big. It's the same sort of thing as as, as what we're doing here. Um, so I, I think we're in a very exciting time, which is just not exciting for entrepreneurs, for startups, and so on. But because of the passion that we have, um, we really can, uh, we really can uh, change the world just by these simple actions. And, and so I, I also think that we're, we're kind of like the guardians of something. And I think we're the guardians of of the future in a way and and we're the, and so if you to be the guardian of the future then the question you ask is and maybe when you get you know my age you start asking this question more than when you're starting on the business but 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 eventually you come to the point where where you ask yourself what is the legacy that I'm leaving right and it and it eventually becomes at some point it becomes about legacy and, and that becomes either one of contribution or one of consumption, as, as Roger, Roger Hamilton says so well. Um, and so I, I think that's, that's kind of, if you can have, again, it, I, I'm worried by saying this because it sounds woo-woo, right? But I'm just um, incredibly, um, what's the word, inspired by the fact that it's now happening. And, and it's happening at a speed which is astonishing. And, and it's happening with, with um, young people who, uh, you know, there's uh, things going on in the United Kingdom with uh, people who are out of work and they're doing all sorts of interesting things there. With them. So it's coming from those kind of people. And I think that's just a very, very exciting place to be. Thank you so much for inspiring <laughs> me. And, and I'm pretty sure that you've inspired absolutely everyone here in oh, the room. Nice so can we have a round of applause for Paul, please? <laughs> thank, thank you, you so much. much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. So can we open up for questions? Have we got time for questions? Oh, really? So has anyone here got a question that they'd like to ask Paul? Oh, Kerry, please. Hang on a minute. The microphone's coming. Hi there, Paul. Um, Kerry, we've met a couple of times. Yes. Do, do you have a protege? A pro is that like a, some some medical thing? Well, maybe you could oh, no, that, check, no, sorry, check it on the app. No, sorry, that's something. <laughs> do I have a protege? Yes. Is that your question? Yeah. Um, I, as in an official one? No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but as in, do I get fortunate enough to be able to work with uh, you know young people in various various okay. things? Yeah. And so. Good. Um, yeah, what you, you just checking. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Good. Good, good, good. Well, I'm but I think going to be around for a long time anyway, so. Yeah. <laughs> but no, that's a that's a good thing. That's a good question. Yeah, it is. Anyone I sense else? there I sense there was a remand in that question. Yes, very good.
Hi again, Paul. Hi, <laughs> um, Tonight we have two of my favourite, or oh, the, the soul man here who represents, he's my hero in Bali as a charity. And um, I don't know you girls very well, but an amazing job that they're doing. Um, could you speak a little bit about, as a charity, how important it is to become part of B1G1, not just as a business, because then they become transparent and, you know, they can get on the ground again and do what they do best mm. um, without having to go door knocking and, and you know, the, all this charity fatigue that we're feeling in Bali. Yeah. So the people that I've invited here tonight to listen to, I really would like you to sort of explain that. It's a great, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, I learned a lot on that, that question when we had the first B1G1 study tour and, and we went to Kenya uh, because... Some of you know that one of the projects in B1G1 is goats, right? And I happen to like goats, right? So, so uh, no, seriously. So one day I got all these goats given me for my birthday. And someone said, wouldn't it be great if we delivered them? So, <laughs> so, and so we go to this, uh, this goat farm, which uh, is uh, in a very interesting place called Odede uh, in Kenya. And it's, it was, before the goats, it was a godforsaken place. Uh, the, the people didn't have anything to kind of look forward to. And anyway, it's now the largest uh, sustainable goat farm in, in Africa. Right? So it's very interesting. And, and I met this Kenyan guy um, who was actually a, a – uh, he was the beneficiary of a World Vision thing as well. And uh, we, we talked about how you create projects and everything. And he said, he said, well, you always ask a question whenever we think about a project. And he said, the question that we ask, and I think more and more, more and more charities need to be asking this question, because if, if you get into, uh, and if, if you get into the traditional way that charities do it, and the traditional way that charities do it is to have, for example, a website with a big red button that says donate, right? Or, or they have people with, um, you know, shaker tins and, you know, and all of that sort of stuff. So if you get into that, then, then there's a problem. And this, this young, young guy in Kenya uh, said, whenever we start a project, we always ask a question. And he said, the question we ask is, what do we do with this project when the funding stops? How, how do we do that? With the now, the interesting thing about that question is the, the only way to answer that question is to do it as if there was no funding. It, do you see what I'm saying? And then when you do that, you create, uh, a, I think, a very attractive thing then for other people to, to be a part of. It's not always possible to do that, but I think if we can go about things in that, in that way, uh, and the other thing uh, I think that's very interesting about B1G1, as I think many people know, because I talked about it today, um, in, in B1G1, we actually reject six out of every seven. Of, of the projects that come. And that's simply, be, well, there's a lot of reasons for that. But one of the reasons for that is there's some weird stuff that goes on in that, <laughs> in that uh, charity space, you know. Uh, but I, I obviously don't want to get into that. But, but uh, so, um, yeah, and, and, you know, next, in the next couple of weeks, we're, we're going to, um, on the B1G1 study tour, and we will be in India, as it happens, looking at, some projects, and you just, I mean, it, it's, it's just life-changing to, to see what, what people are doing and how they're doing it and how they're bringing technology into these places. Some of you would have seen what Mark Zuckerberg was doing uh, last week when, when he visited, that, you know, about the internet thing. Um, and, and so, again, a friend of mine whose name is Frederick, Frederick Haran, he says um, there's a difference between a developing country and a developed country, right? And so he, he puts it this way. He says, so the interesting question is, do you live in a developed country or a developing country? So if you ask people in Australia, do you live in a developed country or a developing country? Most of them would say we live in a developed country, right? So if I said to you, well, you're grown up, what does that mean? It means you've stopped growing. You see, so the moment you get, you say, oh, no, I live in a developed country, then there's a possibility that you stop developing, okay? Um, and, and that's why I think when we go, you mentioned, you know, Indonesia and all of that, when we have the opportunity, and I'm very fortunate to, to be able to do that, and 
see what's going on and it just opens your eyes. And, and I, I don't mean that it opens your eyes in the sense that, you know, there are starving children and you feel guilty about that. Because that's, the, again, that is not a sustainable model. Please don't ask me to give because, uh, because somehow or other I'm feeling guilty about what happens there. That is just not sustainable. And so in, in, in B1G1, we're very clear that it's all about sharing the joy of giving. And, and when, we, when we get that, it again changes everything. So, so the, the long wind, that's a very long-winded answer. But it is to say that when we see what people are doing and finding solutions to things that you just would not imagine, it's, it's amazing. And it, and it all comes from it, it all comes from the questions that you ask. And I think from a charity perspective, that whole thing about what do we do when the funding's gone, how do we set it up? So, and maybe we then get an answer, which is, oh my God, we actually don't need to get people to fund it because it's self-funded. Do, do you see what I mean? And, and then it can grow. Yeah. Great question. <laughs> Have we got any more questions? No one's going to because I, I take 15 minutes to answer their questions. Mark's got one for you. <laughs> Hang on a minute. <laughs> Sorry about the length of that. Excuse me for not getting up. I'm welded to this chair. That's right. Uh, Mark, uh, I'm here with my sons. And uh, the oldest one here is starting up a, a business with some school friends. Great. Uh, I just wondered what advice, apart from listening to your father, would you, would you, would you give? <laughs> Actually, I, I, can I say that I'm probably, I, I probably think that's not good advice. But anyway, no. <laughs> um, so your son, could, could we have, uh, could he, could, can he tell us what, uh, what, what the, what the business, and your first name is? Benji. Correct. Well done. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a great start. Very good. Uh, so, um, so what is the what is the business? We're going to uh, private label and sell products on Amazon. Okay. And right now we're just narrowing down products and looking for suppliers and things. Okay. And can I ask you a question? Are you clear why you're doing that? Um. Yes. I. I don't really understand the question. Uh, okay, so we, we see this opportunity, which is an opportunity for us to make money so that it puts us through school or whatever it is. Is that kind of like the motivation yeah. for that to white label things, which is, a, which is an okay thing, right? It's an okay thing. So what's the, what's the, <laughs> what is the best advice um, in that situation? Um, I... Let, can I give you some out-of-the-box advice? Yeah. Would that be okay? Um, and it's a, it's a story that, that some of us may not know, but it's an interesting story. And it relates to all of the other questions that have been asked. And some of us would know that there's a guy called Biz Stone. And Biz Stone, together with a guy called Jack Dorsey, formed, <laughs> for their sins, they were the guys who created Twitter. Okay? And uh, so Twitter is kind of interesting. And uh, Biz Stone wrote uh, uh, and it's one of the best books I read last year, or this year. And it's a book, and the book is called What a Little Bird Taught Me. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's about that. Um, and it, it talks about the whole startup thing. And so I would, I, one of the things that I would do, I would certainly read this book. And the, and the book would give you some, some interesting stuff. The next thing I would do is I would go to something like, see, where do we go to get training? I would go to Skillshare, and I would, I, I would look on Skillshare, and for $25, I can get this guy talking to me about how to create a startup. I mean, it's amazing that that's there on, on Skillshare. So I, should, I, would, I, would, I would get all that thing, but, but then I would, I would go back and I would listen to what Biz Stone write, wrote. So here we are, let's say, and we're reading Biz Stone's book. And, and we get to, like, about that much left, okay? So in other words, we've gotten maybe 85% of the book read. And, oh, actually, it's a bit thicker. It's about like that. And then there's this really interesting chapter heading from the guy who created Twitter. And the chapter heading is giving. That's the chapter heading. And he says, and I bet you there's no one in the room that knows this. And, and he says, um, I was always clear that when we did Twitter, it was going to be for the greater good. I was always clear about that. 
And he said, and it's documented, and he said, to make sure that happened, the first person that we hired was not a salesperson. He said, the first person, and it's there in the book, you go and buy the book, you know, things that Little Bird told me. He said, the first person we hired is someone who could look after the giving. And the reason I think that's good advice is because it gets you off yourself and it gets you onto things that might matter. And when it gets you onto things that might matter, that actually becomes a much bigger thing than what you otherwise would have thought. So I, does that advice make sense? Does it sound good? Yeah, is, is that, yeah. Is that, so, oh, okay. <laughs> and of course, make sure Soul Man is the, is, the, is the thing of choice, yeah. By the way, congratulations on what you do with that too. Yeah. So have we got any more questions? Looks like we're questioned out. So it leaves me to say a huge thank you, Paul. Um, I know that you're an inspiration to me, and I know that you'll have motivated and inspired everyone else. So once again, can we please have a massive round of applause for Paul Dunn? <laughs> <laughs>